let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host. I'm the creator, and I'm also the chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation about the future of higher education. But before we meet our guest, let me introduce the program and explain what it is, where it came from, how it works, and what we hope to achieve. So the forum is now a little bit more than five years old. Uh, we've been doing this uh, since 2016. What this is, is a weekly conversation about the future of colleges and universities worldwide. We don't do presentations. What I'm doing now with a couple of slides for a moment is just the intro. The overall uh, plan is to just have questions and answers, discussion back and forth. And with a really great range of people, we have folks from multiple countries, from multiple institutional types, and from all kinds of professions. We have university presidents, students, librarians, technologists, faculty members, as well as people from areas adjacent to higher education, everything from education-related businesses to nonprofits to governments. And we have a pretty wide range of voices covering a wide range of opinions. So that is our goal. That is how we function. Now, looking ahead a little bit, I just want to point you to the next few sessions coming up over the next month that we have sessions on how to support equity in higher education. We have uh, today's the first of two sessions on reinventing universities. We have a session on the science of learning and how that impacts how we structure education. We have a session on an analytics project, which is very interesting, and another one on leadership. If you'd like to find out more, just head to our new site at forum.futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do this work with the help of some generous sponsors and supporters who I'd like to thank before we proceed. Uh, NyserNet is one of them in New York State, where they help at state's colleges and universities get online and do great work with broadband and professional development. We really approve their work and we're grateful for their support. We're also really grateful to Shindig because, as you can see here, they make available the technology we're using right now. So if you haven't used it before, if you haven't used it for a while, let me just walk you through the key parts to show you how to participate most effectively. Where I am right now, and where the slide is, again, just for a minute, is called the stage. And we call it that because everybody involved in this conversation, all 119 of you, 120 of you, can see and participate in and hear everything that goes on on this stage. Now, if you look below me on your screen, the bottom half of it, you should see around up to 20 different icons swirling around you. Now, some of them are going to be individual silhouettes. Some of them will be video fades of people, sometimes two or more people sitting around the same camera. But that is your part of the participant swarm, uh, what people sometimes call the audience. And if you look around, you can just mouse over individuals and you can get a little bit more information about them. Uh, but if you want to have a private conversation with them, just double click on their icon. If they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audiovisual conversation. It's like being in an auditorium and leaning over to somebody and whispering to them. Now, I mentioned this is about conversation, so let me show you the main ways that proceeds. If you look at the bottom of the screen, beneath all those participants, you should see a white strip with a few different buttons on it. And the leftmost edge of it will have a button with a number. It's now 127. If you click that, up will pop two boxes. Uh, one is a kind of film strip view of everybody involved in this conversation, if you want to learn more about them. But on the right edge of it, you'll see a chat box. And that's just your basic chat box. You can type in comments, jokes, questions, thoughts, URLs, whatever you like. And we find that people tend to use that for informal conversation. Uh, people say where they're from. Uh, Nathan Kelber from Rosedale Park. Sure, I know it. Uh, I used to live in Ann Arbor, and my wife's from south, uh, south of Detroit. And my father lives in Pontiac right now. Um, and so people often put question ideas there, and it's just a pretty easy, fluid way to do it. Donald, congratulations on getting your COVID vaccine. Now, on the white strip, there are two other buttons that are a bit more powerful. One of them is a question mark, and one of them is a raised hand. If you'd like to type in a question or a comment, just press that little question mark button. Up will pop a box, type in your question or comment, and then hit send, and I get to see it. When the time is right, I flash it on the screen for everyone to see, and then I read out loud so everyone, including our guest, can hear it and respond to it. Now, if your camera is on and you feel like talking with all of us, well, press that raised hand button that tells us you want to join us up here on stage. And when the time is right, I press another button and pop, 
there you appear and you get to have a face-to-face -face conversation with myself and more importantly with our guest in fact we can have several different people up here at one time so we can create a kind of pop-up panel so those those two buttons on the bottom are the main way people participate either by taping and typing a question or raising their hand to join us in the video now if any of you are on twitter just uh, make sure that you tweet either at me brian alexander or better yet use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, we find that people during a session will sometimes tweet out observations or events that happen they find interesting. And sometimes people who can't make it will tweet in a question or conversation item for us to take a look at. Those are all the ways that you can participate. And that's how all of this can work. And we're really grateful to Shindig for making that available. I'd also like to really uh, thank our supporters on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a crowdfunding site that lets you collaboratively fund an ongoing project or um, an ongoing research effort. In this case, it's our look into the future of higher education. People contribute as little as a dollar a month just to keep the lights on, the machines happy. And you can see here people who contribute $10 or more a month. Wonderful people like Corey Snow, Eileen Frank, Chris Johnson, uh, Jeannie Kim Han, Erwin DeVries. It's wonderful to have their support, and we're grateful to them. You can join them. Just go to Alexander. Excuse me. Go to patreon.com slash Alexander. Now, all of that uh, is an introduction uh, to this week's fantastic guest, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome President Paul LeBlanc. Uh, Paul is the president of Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, a university that has gone through some enormous and extensive changes under his leadership. Uh, it is now uh, a leading university in what it does with online learning. It's also had a lot of interesting ideas which it's managed to deploy everything from its structure to how it handles competency-based learning, how it reaches out to people around the world, and how it scales up to absolutely enormous size. Some people call it a mega university. So with that, I'd like to just put these slides off the stage and bring President Paul LeBlanc up in their stead. Hi, Brian. Greetings. Greetings, Paul. Very good to see you. It's so nice to be with you as well, my old friend. Well, my long time friend. I'm going to say old friend. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate both thoughts. <laughs> Let me ask you the most important question someone can ask someone in uh, Upper New England. Uh, how's the snow and the temperature there? Uh, it's a bright sunny day. The snow is sparkling and it's a little chilly, but it feels like the days are getting longer and spring is on the way, so. Ah, uh, good. Yeah, good. we're feeling good. Glad to hear it. Um, I have I have so many, so many questions to ask. Um, and my job is to really get out of the way and let everybody else ask their better questions. But one I have to ask at the beginning is a kind of introduction question. I ask all the guests, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects, the big ideas that are going to be taking up most of your time and most of your mind. Yeah, so it was interesting when you did the agenda and I thought those are each separate topics. They're all interrelated, right? We have to do all of those things together. So I think, you know, for us, the so what are the big rocks in front of us right now? Where am I spending my time? I'm probably spending more of my time thinking about how we reinvent leadership and how leadership happens at SNHU. So it's really about culture change. Um, and we could go, we could spend the whole hour, we could spend a whole day on this one. Cool. But I have this sort of, you know, increasing conviction that in this VUCA world in which we live, where things happen very quickly, and there's no better example of that than a pandemic, that the sort of hierarchical, siloed, ultimately rigid, and mostly top-down nature of universities makes them very vulnerable and less resilient. That, um, so we've spent over three years now working with groups like the Institute for the Future and the Center for Creative Leadership and others to think about how do we move away from a top-down command and control leadership culture to one in which leadership happens at every level and we're much more A, able to harness the smarts and creativity of people wherever they sit in the organization and I can give you some examples and B, um, how can we be much more shape-shifting and quickly adjust to both opportunity and threat. Mm. So that we don't sit in those silos, we don't sit within those hierarchies. It's really hard work and it feels to me like some months, some weeks, we get it right, uh, more right than wrong. And then in other places like, ay, 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 why we like, we revert it again. So it's a very uneven work in progress. And it starts because we're 
we've been top down. And so it starts with me changing my own leadership practices and recognizing the shortcomings in that and then demanding that of the people on my team, but then also inviting people at every level to step up. So if you're a, mm -hmm. if you're a new, you know, academic advisor who's working for us and you've been here three months and you have a student who's really struggling with something and you take care of that problem before you ask for, without asking for permission, I would call that leadership. Like that's leadership courage in the moment. Right. So, so again, I could, we could talk about this, but that's, that's the biggest one. You know, all the other things are the things everyone in this call is working on, right. Which is how do we think about creating a digital enterprise for the future? What does that actually mean in a higher ed context? Mm -hmm. um, we're spending a lot of time, excuse me, thinking about how do we optimize our product mix? So moving much more aggressively into non-degree micro credentials and which ones, and how do you think about that? Um, and so wh wherever you want to go, but those are the three big rocks, right? Optimizing product and process, digital platform, and most importantly, changing our leadership culture. And those are rocks that you may not be able to see in your own eyes. Oh, oh. Um, sorry. Oh, there's a little bit of feedback or a little bit of echo here. Um, I hope that's not me. Well, let's try this again. I was going to say those are three huge rocks that you might not be able to see under all that snow, but um, uh, but those are very impressive. Uh, friends, if if you're if you're new uh, to President LeBlanc and his work, if you're new to Southern New Hampshire, that just gave you a quick intro, just a, a quick sketch of of the kind of unusual thinking he's got. And before I can ask any more questions, folks have already come up with their own. And so let me just start the ball rolling with one from our mutual long-term friend. Phil Long, my colleague at Georgetown. Um, and Phil asks, it appears from the pandemic experiments, there is a bipolar response. Any interest to return to the way it was ASAP and an interest in rethinking higher ed? Where is SNU in this? How far does systematic change go? Yeah, God, Phil, I think you're so spot on. I see, you know, I've had the pleasure this past year of chairing the ACE board. Um, so that's a pretty wide swath of American higher ed. And, and just generally in, in these kinds of conversations, I have colleagues who are like, let me ride this out, hunt her down, and as soon as this is done, screw this distance learning thing, I'm going back. I'm getting back to the way things used to be and I can't wait. Um, and then I think there are other folks who are thinking, we're never going back. I was, I'm wearing a tie today because I was part of a Ministry of Higher Education function in the UK, well, <laughs> projecting into the UK. Um, where they're talking about what are the things we don't want to let go of now? Like we just accelerated the adoption of online learning across the country, a big experiment. How much of that will we hold on to? Um, we, you know, we have thousands of employees who are mostly an online enterprise, but most of them work in Manchester. We'll never go back to having as many people in a single building again. We are, we have 67% of our people said they want to continue with remote work. And now we can start to rethink the organization. You know, as we want to be more diverse, if we're going to commit to remote work, we're going to hire it out of Detroit. We're going to hire out of the Southwest. We're going to get a much more diverse employee base. And we can hire in the underserved communities where we want to educate people. Now we can do both. We can educate and we can hire from that talent pool. So I think it's exciting to think about what is now possible for us. Oh, well, that's fascinating. Um, that's a great question to ask. But, uh... Once the pandemic ends, or once the virus drops to a level of incidence so it's below pandemic, what do you want to keep from this? I, I, I think, friends, that's a great question you can take to uh, all of your communities on this. We have uh, more questions just piling in, uh, and one has come from uh, Lisa Sieverts uh, at uh, Harvard Extension. And Lisa asks, let me put this on stage, what tangible changes are you making to stop being top down as an institution and yourself? Um. So we all work in higher ed in an expert culture where status accrues to those who know a lot. Um, it, in my experience, it usually means people don't often say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and people more often opine than ask questions. And I, with my team, you know, at the end of a two hour meeting said, do you realize like no one used a question mark here today, including me, we all sort of, you know, so we take turns and we don't. So how do you, how do we think about that? So let me go back to sort of a concrete example. So after the George Floyd murder, we announced a $5 million social justice fund and had sort of three, cool. three sort of uh, areas of focus. One is emergency money, right? In the middle of the pandemic, we saw a lot of our students of color, especially struggling with access uh, up in the middle of the night because that's the only quiet time they could get to study or get the one family computer. So what do we do for those students? And then the bigger question longer term was, 
what does it mean to be, um, what does it mean to work at SNHU and to be um, a, a, a person of color in our context? And then how do we think about that in terms of students? So in our old practice, our top-down practice, I would have pulled together all of our key folks. I would have brought in our chief diversity officer. We might have hired a consultant. And then we would have figured out how to spend that $5 million, and we would have announced something, and everyone would have applauded us. They would have said, God, this is great. We love the fact that leadership is responding to George Floyd. What we did in this case instead is we said, we're going to create three um, communities of practice, 20 people each around each of these things. We're going to give them good facilitation and tools so that they know how to do community of practice. And the way you get in is you have to demonstrate credibility on these questions, and you have to demonstrate passion. Everyone has to know that you know stuff about this, and everyone has to know that you care deeply. And it, you didn't get in through positional power. You get chosen because of those two things. So that's messy, and they went through this period of storming, norming, conforming, starting the work. But those three groups, they're deciding how to spend the $5 million, not me, not my team, not leadership. We're not signing off on this. They get the authority, and they're empowered to do that. That's an example where I think we got it right, because now, the organization feels like they own this. And you get people, right? People are serving on those capacities, again, not through positions of power, our authority, but but those other criteria. And they're equal members of that community and in that conversation. So that's an example where I think we get it right. And, and I have examples, by the way, where we get it wrong as well. What's interesting, as I would observe, is that I think at the highest level of leadership, it's sinking in. I mean, it better be after all this work and we keep pounding on ourselves, like get better at this. It's now actually what one trustee called the frozen middle that's kind of trying to figure this out because there are those folks who have sort of moved up the organization. They now have positions of some authority. They're kind of mid-level management, if I can use that phrase. Well, and what got them there in our culture was you're really good at your job. And we had an individual hero culture. Hey, Brian really killed it. Like, you know, he's getting a bonus this year. We're gonna shine a light on that good work. And now we're saying to them, it's really not about you, Brian. It's about you have to demonstrate to us how you took the 10 people on your team and how you made them better. Mm -hmm. How do you make them leaders? So this idea of leaders creating leaders, I know it can sound very jargony, like stuff you put on a conference room poster, but it really makes a difference to our people. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. Uh, it's Lisa, awesome, right? It's culture change. And culture change is hard. Oh, it is. Uh, Lisa, thank you for the uh, excellent direct question. We And thank you, Paul, for the, for the uh, very, very practical answer. Uh, we have questions about uh, SNU and uh, certification degrees. Uh, Kiel Doomsch, longtime uh, participant in the forum, asks straight up, I love the competency-based model, but I'm afraid the degree from SNHU won't ever be esteemed in the way as an Ivy or other prestige degree. What is Dr. LeBlanc doing to address this? Well, two things. One is the prestige in our current model in which quality is so ill-defined mm. goes to a whole bunch of inputs and prescriptions and status markers that don't actually have a clear tie to demonstrable student learning and achievement. So what I really love about a competency model, but it only works if you have rigorous assessment and we can talk about what that means. But in a competency model, you don't get to be able to hide behind the bush of status marker. In other words, when Clay Christensen talks about status reach across our industry, he's talking about everyone trying to work towards some ideal and that ideal is often Harvard. Like, you know, that's kind of, that's blue chip or Princeton, if you wish, or Yale or Stanford. How do we look more like that? Um, so, so again, you've got whole accredit accreditation has been largely, not all, entirely now with some focus on outcomes, but largely based on processes and inputs. Um, and if you take a look at what counts for quality, take a look at the rankings, how much endowment do you have? Um, why do schools trying to move up the status ladder mount up Division I athletic programs? Because they think in the minds of the market, you must be a more legitimate or better school if you have Division I football, for example. In a competency-based model, you have to do something very different. You have to stand behind the claims for your learning. You have to be crystal clear about them and why they're the right claims. But then more importantly, you have to show with great rigor, that is reliability, validity, right? You have to show great rigor that students actually have demonstrated mastery of those competencies. I think over time, employers are going to be the people who vote on this question. And when they can say from a community college, I'm getting kick-ass programmers, and look, there is some evidence, for example, that computer programmers out of, um, I forget which community college is in Florida, were outperforming their counterparts at Stanford, <laughs> right? And this was startling to everybody. Well, how could that be? 
Do you know, uh, Vivian Ming is, did this research and it was really interesting, right? So what we know is that in a lot of elite schools, you've got students who are unbelievably good test takers and they have good general work habits, right? That's how they got in. But it isn't the same as being able to demonstrate genuine mastery and proficiency in the kinds of skills that employers want. So, I, I, it, you know, we're not on some level, we'll never supplant the Ivy League in terms of status because it's about a whole bunch of other things, right? If I use Clay Christensen, Christensen's jobs to be done theory, if you come to SNHU, you come to get a job done, which is typically for our adult learners, I need a credential that unlocks an opportunity. I'm stuck. I need a better job. I need to move up. They're not thinking about status. The, our, our employee, our excuse me, our students, I would say, we educate the 45% of Americans who would struggle to come up with 400 bucks for an unexpected car repair. That's who we serve. Mm -hmm. It's not Harvard or SNHU. Yeah. Um, and, and I think when we look at those students, that's a job they want done. For the students who come to our campus, we're a non-selective residential traditional campus, they want two things done. They want a credential that will give them a good career, but they also want a coming of age experience. And what we saw in the pandemic is when we separated those two things, it really shone a light on what people value or don't value. They'll say, wait a minute, I'm not paying full tuition if I don't get the coming of age experience. What are you talking about? Right? So we saw that play out in the pandemic. But I think Harvard or the Ivy League gives you a third job to be done, which is a value added network that's incredibly powerful. And it starts on the day you get your acceptance letter. Yes. That's the. And we can't match that. We had um, uh, Brian Kaplan. Um, uh, as a guest uh, a few years ago, and, and he made this case as perhaps the uh, one of the most important things you get uh, from higher education. Hey, uh, Kyle, I would say I got a, a respond to Kyle in the chat who says, but we can't have a system where SNH grads are stuck at the bottom. They're not stuck at the bottom. If we take a look at the way they move in their life, mm -hmm. what we see, and it's hard to get good income data and earnings data, as you know, because of arcane rules that don't allow the Department of Ed and the IRS to link their databases, but we can do this with some states. It's that students have a demonstrably improved life, right? They're paying yeah. off their student loans. They're making more money. Well, in some of our programs in inner city, and it's not going to sound like a lot to you at the moment, but to go from $14,000 a year of income to 37, that's a game changer, and it gets them on a path. Now, if you're saying um, that we don't have a selection system, this is already in place. Like, everyone knows that, that graduates that you know some people have argued higher ed is itself a selection system mm -hmm. and of course if you're in the ivy league you've been selected into the top tier you're in the club well thank you for, for addressing that and Kiel, thank you for the really really solid question we we had a couple of other questions that followed up on that line i want to make sure that we uh that we get a chance to talk to them uh andrea reen who's uh, associate dean at the whittier college asked about the competency model can you talk about the process of moving toward it what did you do first and who needs to be at the table? Sure, Andrea. We um so as we move to this model, you you know, it it's I, I, is this a process question or I guess it's a sort of how did we get there? For us to get there, we had to sort of create a group and separate it from the core organization. Because again, I'm gonna, you know, Clay was a huge influence on my life. He passed away last year, Clay Christensen, but he was on my board for nine years and was a trustee emeritus. Wow. We, like, we used his playbook, and the playbook said if you're gonna do something that's genuinely disruptive as competency based education, if you try to do it from within the organization, the mothership will try to incorporate it or spit it out as foreign tissue. I'm mixing my metaphors. It's like the body treats foreign tissue, you either incorporate it or you spit it out. So I, my job was to create a group, stand up a team separate them and buffer them from the core organization, which was looking over the wall saying, why can't we do that? Or let us get involved. Or, what the hell's going on over there? Or, we don't trust it. It's like, oh. just let them do their work. And then of course it was really understanding what the model required. And it does require a different kind of thinking about how you, you ask different questions about how you develop programs. And it starts with the end, right? It starts with what are the things we want students to know and be able to do with that knowledge? How do we know those are the right things? What are those tied to? How do we validate those claims? How do we know those claims are the right ones? And then you sort of work backwards from that to say, what are the assessments that reveal that? And if you're saying, what can they do with what they know? You're inherently talking about performance-based assessments. Higher ed's not very good at that. We actually only do performance-based assessments, generally speaking, where our lives depend on it. Nurses, doctors, pilots, right? 
hey, it's great that you got a 4.0. We don't care. You're going to take exams or you're going to take boards and you're going to put a ton of hours in in clinicals under the watchful eye of an expert who can attest to your ability. But we don't do that with most of what we teach. But so you build performance based assessments and then you work backwards into content. Then you work backwards into learning modalities. And I think one of the things that people often, at least my own faculty would sometimes say, is you're trying to dictate the way I teach. And I was saying it's just the opposite. Because when you can be clear about the claims for the end of the process, for what happens at the end of it, and we can know that with confidence, i.e. good assessment, you can get students there any old way you like. I don't care. If you want to, if traditional methods get you there, go for it. If all workplace-based methods get you there, go for it. Like it doesn't matter. And in fact, a book I'm just I'm sending out to Harvard Education Press on Monday. So I'm right at the end here of proofreading. Yes. Um, uses a, includes a whole chapter on design and within competency-based and uses case studies. So if you take a look at what WGU does, looks very different than our delivery model. If you take a look at what Lipscomb does, looks very different than our delivery model. There's a wonderful school of theology in South Dakota that's adopted competency-based learning. For those of you who think it can only be for vocational skills, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful work. Well, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. We also have, a, uh, I think, a clarification, or a really precise question, speaking of degrees, from uh, Tim Neubert, uh, who asks about uh, education degrees. Uh, you offer several master's degrees in education, but no bachelor's degrees in education. Can you explain why? Uh, we do have bachelor's degrees in education, but they're at the uh, they're on the campus. They're in the traditional modality, and the reason we don't do it online is uh, fifty different state compliance regimes. So uh, it's a bear, and you come up against the same issue if you do clinical health programs as well. Um, so it's a big it's a big lift to get approval with each one different from the other. Um, and we did launch we've launched our first clinical program. And we're learning how we have to move through compliance in order to do that. So this is a master's in uh, counseling, um, which has a clinical component. But it is it is a heavy lift. Thank you for answering that so so directly. And Tim, thank you for the for the great question. The um, other thing I would add to that, and it's one we wrestle with a lot, mm -hmm. is mapping to someone's earlier question about how you know do students get stuck at the bottom or et cetera, as um, Kyle. Um, I mentioned, but I think it's, we also worry about earnings to debt uh, in education. Mm -hmm. So we've started to map those ratios out across everything we offer to try to track that um, and, 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 and maybe cut programs where we feel like we can't ethically ask students to borrow for a program in which their debt will be greater than their first year salary. As you know, mm. Luna has a calculation around this. Mm. I think the US Department of Ed recommends that a student not spend more than 20% of their gross earnings on their loan repayment. So if you start to think about hard about that, it's not a pretty picture for a lot of the institutions, including my own, on this call. That's a very that's a really keen analytical tool. Uh, Tim, thank you for the question. Uh, he's from the American Association for Employment and Education. We have another association uh, leader with a question. This is uh, our friend Joy Connolly at the uh, ACLS. And she asked a faculty question. Do you see uh, SNU's faculty reward structure as similar to those or different from those in other universities? And what change in faculty reward structure would you most like to see? Yeah, hi, Joy. So on our traditional campus, it would look absolutely familiar full-time faculty with all of the classics that are moving up through. We don't have tenure, but we have rolling contracts where the only way you don't get renewed would be for the same reasons you wouldn't get renewed for tenure. That is moral turpitude or just cause or a program cut has to be cut um, across uh, generally. So so we, it would look very, very familiar. With our online programs, we use many more adjunct faculty. So the answer would be no. Um, and they teach in a very, very different model. So we don't ask of them a lot of what we would ask for even an adjunct faculty member in a traditional modality. That is, all of the courses have been designed in a model that goes all the way back to the 60s in the Open University with design teams that include subject matter experts, instructional designers, assessment experts, content experts. So those teams create courses. So it's the only way we can do scale with some level of uniform quality assurance. That is, you know, in a given semester, we might have 600 sections of intro to psych. 
So how do we reassure ourselves that we that that, that course is happening in a good way? Um, because we're asynchronous, the faculty are not meeting students in a class. They don't have that kind of schedule. And of course, they're not doing committees and everything else. So we ask a full-time faculty member on our campus. So it's a very different model. It uh, doesn't have the rewards um, that you would associate with traditional faculty roles. Oh, great question. And hello, Joy. Hello. Good to see you. Um, and great answer, of course. Uh, friends, I, I see you have absolutely no difficulty at all in entering questions into the Q&A box. Um, if you would like to uh, uh, join us on stage, just uh, press the raised hand button, and uh, I'll beam you up uh, to join us as well. Uh, we have questions from another academic adjacent association. We have Corey Snow from Salesforce. Um, and uh, Corey asks, noting the announced convergence of your neighbors in the New Hampshire state system, what is your view on mergers, acquisitions, and partnerships across the broader EDU ecosystem? Well, the ecosystem is changing before our eyes. Mm. And that's going to include, so I think you know, we're all reading the same press, right? So we're seeing mergers within state systems as they deal with um, already big cuts and probably pretty long-lived cuts because the state's going to get racked by the impact of the, of the pandemic and the recession. Um, we see non-selective privates really struggling, and I think we'll see mergers and acquisitions in that category. We see new partnerships, and this is the sort of part of the ecosystem change that I think is getting less comprehensive attention, if I can put it that way, or coherence around the whole of it. Um, you know, you think about the Kaplan Purdue's, where you see the for-profits now kind of merging in with institutions. There are other examples of those as well. Um, this week, you saw the announcement of 2U, an OPM that's bringing pretty high branded institutions into online, now partnering with Guild, which now draws the link over to large scale employers like Walmart and Disney and Discover and others. So now all of a sudden, you're, we've long talked about the break between higher ed and the workforce. Those two intermediaries together are now drawing a bridge or a link between them. And that's a new interesting play. You've got, um, it used to be if you went to ASU GSV Summit probably four or five years ago, the narrative was new ed tech providers are going to blow up the dinosaurs that are incumbent higher ed. That okay. narrative has given away to new ed tech providers are not going to partner with higher ed to help higher ed do that with which it struggles. So you have other kinds of partnerships like Trilogy. We're going to come onto your campus and we're going to add that coding boot camp that gets your English major with just three or six more months, more job offers and, and a better job. And we know, right, from Strata, that first jobs matter. Uh, we know that if you know you are in a um, sort of sub-degree or mal-employed uh, position out of college, five years later, 50% of those people will still be underemployed. And 10 years later, 75% of that group will still be underemployed. So first jobs matter a lot. Um, yeah. So I do think that ecosystem is changing dramatically and mergers and acquisitions and disappearances is one part, but it's only one part of a much bigger change. It's as if, you know, what's happening to higher ed is like climate change and all of the various components of the forest, some are gonna be okay and thrive, some are gonna die off, some are gonna have to sort of evolve very, very quickly. And we're watching that happen right now. In real time, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, that was really, really good question, Corey, and, and thank you for that uh, really rich response. Uh, we do have a video question, and I want to bring up a, a mutual friend and a near neighbor of yours. Um, this is uh, President Bernard Bull and a former guest on the Future Trends Forum. Let's see. Hello, Bernard. You. Hi, Paul. Thanks for being here. I look forward to your book, checking it out. In some ways, I'm coming from sort of the exact uh, a contrast to SNHU in terms of size at Goddard College, having just sort of navigated a very challenging time. Um, and I'm really interested, though, in your conversation about leadership culture. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this, because I think many of us, we think of SNHU as having um, embraced a lot of sort of centralized control and standardization and standard practices and processes. So how does that align or clash with this uh, collaborative leadership vision that you shared a bit earlier? Yeah, so very much again, Bernard, a work in progress, nice to see you. I would say that um, if you think about 
we have not actually we've moved it's not simply more centralization it's actually more of a matrix organization i don't mean to sort of steep us in business speak yeah. but the ideas we have now we think about our business lines and then we think so think across the top you've got campus you've got online you've got gem which is our refugee serving pop you know program you have community partners which is cb programs with inner city schools so you got all of these lines of business in our old model online would have its own marketing Campus had its own marketing. Everyone had their own marketing. Everyone had their own, right? So now it's a matrix organization where if I, if you can picture the graph down the left side, we've got marketing, we've got admissions, we've got IT, we've got HR, all of those cut across. So that if I lead a line of business, like if I lead online, which is our biggest, I am getting served by the centralized functions, but actually the lines of business are not centralized. They are, they're allowed to kind of live and flourish in the way that they have to because the needs of serving refugee learners in a camp in Kenya look dramatically different than they serving our online students here in the United States look different again than serving homeless kids in LA County. We do have a program that does that as well. So, so each is allowed to kind of pull what they need, but also be different in their own way to serve particularly well the students they have. Even all of that, Bernard, I think when we talk about how do you have a learning organization, how do you sort of empower people, in any of those silos, we want the newest member of the marketing team straight out of college to be in a meeting and be able to push back on the CMO and say, I don't know, like, I'm just out of college. Last month, I was using this platform, and I look at what we're using today, and I think it's really out of date. Like, I need that fresh young voice to be fully in that conversation. So among the things we've been doing is is training what we're calling meeting ninjas. So meeting ninjas are facilitators that anybody can call in anywhere in the organization, but their training is to make sure that every voice is heard in a meeting and to move away from kind of very traditional, the boss speaks, everyone listens and nods, and there's kind of a hierarchy of input. So, and again, I do not want to overstate our progress on this. This is very much a messy work in progress that's gonna to continue to take some time, but we're getting there. Are there some exceptions to it? Like, um, what are the what are the items that you would say need to be centralized, um, even amid this this kind of work that you're doing? Well, you know, I think that's very different from organization to organization. Um, I'm saying an obvious thing, but the way we organize today and the way we operate today looks very different than it did five years ago. It looks very different than it did five years before that. So when when we were in an extremely high growth world uh, rate of that phase of our life. I mean, we were room one right now, but back in 2010, we were hiring 30 to 40 new full-time people every week, wow. just chaos. And um, in that mode, we just wanted to grow and every business line had complete authority. Go off and do it. Like you didn't have to, if you don't like what you're getting from marketing, go hire your own marketing. If you don't like what you're getting from IT, go have your own IT. And of course we got to a certain size and scale where that was just chaos right you got x number of lmss going on the sis is breaking down because people are not putting records in the same way we have duplication and we're not smart because we're not learning from each other so that moved us towards when we launched a kind of one university initiative but that had a lot to do with scale and complexity when we were little we could figure that out we were small enough for me to walk down the hall and go hey brian what are you doing? Like you're about to, you're about to, you know, um, you're about to buy a new LMS. Don't you know that Bernard just sort of did it over here last week? Have you talked to him? No, I didn't talk to him. I'm so busy. I'm going too fast. Okay, time up. We couldn't do that anymore when we get too big. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really interesting dance that you do as you look at organizational growth and complexity and try to figure out how do you move this. Like I would say that we're really struggling with internal communications now because of where we've gotten. As we, not just because we're remote, but even before that. Again, when I could walk down the hall and I knew everyone's name, even when we were pretty big, I could do that. So if you, if Brian said, hey, just heard about this thing that we're launching, but I have no idea what that is and what the hell is it? And how does it fit to my, he could just find me and say, Paul, what's up with this thing? Today, that's not gonna happen so easily. So now we're, we're trying to figure out how do we get better at internal comms? Because I think our people are really clear about their job and their mission and where they fit, but they, they're definitely not clear about how all the pieces fit together. And we have a lot of plates spinning. So that's a long answer to your question. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. More complex thing, we kind of, it depends. <laughs> great question. And, hey, can, I ask, can I answer Robbins, uh, my, my neighbor at Plymouth please, State please. University in the chat? Please. So I think this is a, a 
quite often the sense that CBE is very much focused on content, which is actually not focused on content. It's actually focused on competencies, what you can do with content, what, what you've learned. But that somehow that's very skills are vocationally based. And I would argue, and I was just having this conversation with a friend who heads up a really high, high well-regarded engineering university who said, I've got this problem. My engineer's skills are gonna time out so fast now. Like they're timing out, they used to time out in five to 10 years, they're timing out in three years. And I have to make sure that we're producing graduates who have learned to learn, who can sort of have higher order thinking skills, what Scott Pulsifer at WGU would call enduring skills. They're somehow called soft skills for some reason, they're actually harder to teach. You can, you can, you can teach those skills. Right, you can you can build in learning to learn. You can build in collaboration. We do competencies around working in teams. We have competencies around giving, taking feedback constructively. We have competencies on ethical thinking and reasoning. In fact, these are some of the favorite competencies among our students because they are higher order and they serve them well in that larger way. I think that's a that's a binary that doesn't actually hold. And the fact that you can have competence based programs in theology, I mean, interesting, right? Um, or is one of yeah. yeah, I think, I, I mean, I've fallen prey to this where in the past there were times when I made this distinction between sort of knowing and doing. And in fact, you can't do well if you don't know and your knowledge without the ability to do is, is, is less useful and less deep, right? I mean, I don't want my pilot to tell me how planes land. I really would like him to stick the landing every single time I'm on a plane. Ideally. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, someone asked if they couldn't see the uh, this came from our wonderful friend and previous guest and just an overall genius, Robin DeRosa, who said that it seems like CBE is so content focused. I wonder how students fare when the shelf life of the content gets out of date. Are we abandoning inquiry, learning how to learn, collaboration, network learning, or we only focus on content? So that's what I was just trying to answer, Brian. Exactly. Really both. You have to do both. Always and exactly. honestly, we got too focused in our first iteration, what I call CB 1.0. Some people know it as College for America. Mm -hmm. We did not spend enough time on the knowledge part, the frameworks part. Mm -hmm. So in our second iteration, CB 2.0, we actually tried to address that and start to build in what are the ways we can make sure that students are demonstrating knowledge frameworks mm -hmm. that go beyond the simple ability to do. Because it, as Robin is rightly pointing out, skills time out so fast now. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. That's a, that's a very, very rich answer. I really appreciate that. And Robin has always asked deep, deep questions that make us rethink a lot. Yeah, uh, sorry, Tom, I can't tell you the engineering school was setting confidence. I'm not sure she, this person would want me talking about, but well, yeah. <laughs> we, we have a, a, another question from uh, my uh, uh, new friend, Matthew Alex, who is the, at Beyond Academics. Uh, and what's your question, sir? Dr. LeBlanc, it's good to see you. Um, you have a quote that I always use. It's um, time is the enemy of the poor. And it, it really hits home because everything we tr are trying to do to change higher ed is around the constraints that higher ed has put on itself, the time frame, so forth. I would love the perspective for this audience to hear it in terms of what does time frames do for you know the, the folks that maybe are less fortunate in the ecosystem that we oh. live in the way we serve. So I appreciate that. I love the quote. I use it all the time. And uh, I think it's impactful uh, for this audience. Yeah, I mean, there are probably most people on this call have sort of arrived at that conclusion before I did. But it's really been in the last couple of years where I've had this deepened conviction. It's at the heart of the book that I mentioned. I'm really not showing my book. It doesn't have a title. I couldn't tell you how to order it today. <laughs> um, but, but the conviction is around the degree to which. So I'll say the obvious, which is that everything takes longer if you're poor. If you don't have a washer dryer in your apartment, it takes longer to have clean clothes. If you don't have a car, at least in America, um, it usually takes longer to get food in your refrigerator. And you can just sort of go on and on, but also the inflexibility of time that poor people struggle with. So um, if I work in a fast food job, you know this is a problem, right? I can't have a reliable schedule. Well, how do I commit to a community college schedule that requires me to be at a certain place at a certain time? So it's both time and place. So. I, and I'll give you an example in one of our non-time based programs, our CBE program that we use with a partner named Duet in Boston, a wonderful partner. So young woman, I'm gonna call her Miriam. I think I call her Miriam in the book, not her real name. Um, so single mom uh, from the poorest neighborhood of Boston, uh, low income, has a 10 year old daughter with chronic respiratory illness. 
when we looked at our transcripts from Roxbury Community College and Bunker Hill Community College, we'll probably find college, community colleges, but they were littered with Ws and Fs. So Miriam, what's going on here? Every time her little girl got sick, she'd miss a week of school. Missing assignments, missing exams, never catching up. If it was in time, she would withdraw. If it was too late, she took the F. Um, and you would look at her on paper and say, not ready for college or not a place where she could go to college. When we put her in our program, she flew. She got her associate's degree in under two years. And she said to me, a line I still remember so distinctly, we were sitting talking about her background. She said, every time my little girl gets sick now, I hit the pause button because we weren't time-based. And she said, I make the schedule. I make the schedule. And we talk a lot about personalized learning. We could start with the simplest thing possible, which is let people learn when they can. Now, look at there is a trade off here. There's a con, which is we've also learned the hard way that you have to keep people on some pace. Don't have to be the same pace. You and Brian can go at a different pace depending on your life. And you can hit the pause button, but you can't hit the pause button for long because the data is clear about this. The chances that you will not return when there's so many pulls on your life really expand. But we've had enormous luck with the most marginalized learners in the world. Like we work in refugee camps in Kenya and Malawi. We're in Lebanon. We're in Cape Town, South Africa with urban refugee populations. They have no time. I mean, they line up for, it can take four hours in a day to get food and water. But by letting them learn when they can and by giving them just the right supports in those moments, they are flourishing. They have the highest success rates of any student body we have. Um, because of that. So time is really, so think about it. Time is how we think about financial aid. It's very hard to detach from time because you have things like satisfactory academic progress. Um, what's the time, you know, we define term length. Uh, time is this weird thing we do tied to grades, which is at the 15 week mark, we decide how good you are at something. Yeah. When all the research shows that in some cases, if I give Brian two more weeks, he's gonna get the same grade as you. Does it matter that he took two more weeks? Or does it matter more that he's mastered the material and the learning that we are asking him to do? Todd Rose has a beautiful chapter on this in his book, The End of Average. Um, and we also know, by the way, grades are, are just a mess, right? Great inflation over the last four decades. That's why employers don't trust transcripts. So I think time is just an insidious, deeply flawed way that we think about learning in America and we've built our whole system on it. It's the basic building block of it. It's how we apportion time. It's how we unitize knowledge. It's how we determine faculty workloads. It's how we place, it's how we think about student progress. It posits an average student. There's no such thing, right? It's deeply flawed and it's a terrible measure of how much, how, how of, of student learning, of what somebody actually knows. Sorry, <laughs> that's very pedantic and ranty, but it drives me crazy because it's so inequitable. That, that is great. And I'll be honest, in my discussions, I always use that quote because we're trying to get universities and colleges to rethink how they serve in this time frame that we're in. So, and then the, the question that I think we always get, or at least the roadblock is, well, our creditors are asking us to be this way or government, you know, our sus subsidies are, are given this way. How does uh, universities and colleges get around that? It, it seems like you're, you've been able to do that a little bit. Um, or is this a time for our creditors to revisit the time frame concept, the fact the financial aid is is tied to it. And that I'll, I'll leave it as that, but that, I appreciate yeah. that. So creditors can't do much about the financial aid piece. Financial aid piece is set by the federal, uh, yeah. the federal government. It's built into federal financial aid rules. There is the provision for direct assessment, but the problem with direct assessment and form of competency-based education that isn't tied to time is that none of the underlying administrative rules changed. So even though they talk a good game at the legislative level, there's a word in policy making. It's sort of like the, the administrative rules did not breathe life into the body of the legislation, right? So, so it's been a bear for us to do this. It's not easy. And, and one of the things that we, among others, are trying to do is urge both demonstration projects and experimental sites at the federal level to allow non-time-based dispersal of financial aid. So an easy way to think about this is that if you look at Pell Grants, there's a lifetime limit on Pell, rather than saying you can take that all up the front end and then we'll refund this R2T4 process. I see one of my financial aid people on, so I'm being pretty good, I think, on this. He'll correct me. Um, what if we did um, X, um, X percentage? So if it's 120 competencies to get a bachelor's degree, your financial aid is given on that basis. So 120th of your total eligible amount goes to this competency. If you're doing five of them, then five times that amount, 
50% at the front end when you start, 50% at the back end when you complete. So we start paying for performance for the institution too. So, right, we get all our money, all these institutions on this call, we get all our money on the front end, whether that student is successful or not, no matter how honey, how uneven they're learning. Okay. If they drop out in time, soon, we will refund some of it. Right. But it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible system. Yeah. It's a terrible system. And, it, and it, it, it fails. I mean, the reality is that 45% of students will not graduate within six years. Okay. And we see $1.6 trillion of debt and 50% of the default rate are with students with loans of $8,000 or less. Which is Think about that. 50% of the default rate are for poor students with less than 10. I think it's less than 10 now. Yeah. To be eight. Matthew, thank you. Thank you for your question. And, and speaking of time, we are we are running low on time, and I want to make sure that we get as many of our great questions in as we possibly can. And Paul, you are great. You're yourself. You're just giving us a fountain of, of information. I want to go local and uh, and bring up a, a colleague of mine, uh, Molly Chihak at Georgetown University Center for New Designs and Learning and Scholarship. Molly says, as a big fan, what role do you see of Chegg playing in the lives of students? Academic integrity is a competency. And Chegg seems to complicate that issue. Yeah, so full disclosure, I'm on the board of Chegg and yeah. it's been getting slammed lately around academic integrity and cheating. So cheating is at historically high levels, as you know, a lot of people are, are uh, linking that to the pandemic and this enormous pressures, pressures that students are under. When the, I talked to the folks who head up academic integrity for most of us, uh, most of my institution, which is mostly online, um, they would say they don't have a problem because we use a lot of authentic assessments, performance-based assessments. We don't do a lot of exams in multiple choice and the kinds of sort of test banks that a lot of faculty still use. When you look at our traditional campus, much more of a problem because our full-time faculty are more typically using kind of traditional exams and they're doing these as take-homes necessarily because of the pandemic. So cheating has always happened, but in an age of ubiquitous content and fingertips search, search at your fingertips, students are gonna use all of those tools if the thing that matters is getting a grade and not learning. Like the system and our assessments are not built about learning. They're actually built about getting a grade. And as students have always done, they're gonna make sure if if my sort of, if, if my success is based on the grade and not my learning, yeah. I have a deep incentive to cheat. Okay. If I'm already working too many hours, my mental health is at uh, absolutely no lo new low. Um, I was just at an AC board meeting. Yeah. You know, twenty percent of our students have had suicide ideation in the last nine, nine months. I mean, historic highs, historic yeah. highs. The impulse to cheat yeah. is so high, and if check didn't exist, they'd find some other way to cheat. Yeah. Now, the difference, and I will say this, and I think you know, this is what this is where I'm now putting my board hat on for a moment. If the problem is students using something like check for cheating during exams, they've got new tools for that, and it, they're free, they're easy to use. This is not a pitch, but you have to, I have to sort of say, to be fair to them, they're building the tools. So any of your faculty who are worried about using Chegg during an exam, they can go on, use this tool, and will black their students out of the out of the platform before and after the exam, and it will pull before any of the material can be shared. They're also adding staff, et cetera. But the problem in the end, and I wrote a piece in Forbes about this recently, mm -hmm. it's actually about the way we think about assessment. If, right, we have to rethink assessment. And if, if we're thinking about multiple choice exams and the kinds of things that people are being asked to do, these are not really good assessment practices, right? And we have to really rethink that. That's a, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Uh, it is. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, for mentioning your, uh, your relationship. And, and thank you, Molly, for the question. I haven't seen Molly for a year and I'm, because of the pandemic and I'm, I'm feeling left out. Um, but we have another video question uh and then i think i will take the last question myself uh and this is the video question comes from our friend kelly walsh who has been a previous guest in the program because kelly is among other things uh, an incredible expert on blended uh, learning kelly hello your audio is off let's see <clears throat> now Kelly, you might have to do charades. Do your question. Uh, actually, Five words. Kelly, you, you asked it, your question as a text question. Uh, I could just ask it for you if you like. Okay, we'll do that. Thanks. 
and uh, stay warm uh, in our state. Uh, Kelly's quick. My God, there are a lot of questions today. Uh, Kelly's question has to do with uh, employers. Any suggestions about how higher education can help employers come to understand and apply competency-based learning and learning outcomes? So I think the first issue we had is competencies is a sort of term of art within our industry mm. that um, the world doesn't really sort of use very much. That is, if you think about it, it befuddled students when we talked about competency-based education models. Like, oh, we have a competency-based program. Like, wh what is that? Like, they think about classes. So we have to rethink about how we frame. And so if you say to them, well, look at you have, you have and, and even put it in the wrapper of a course, but make it a competency-based class in which we say, no, it's project-based. You can go as fast or as slow as you need. Like there are ways you can make this comprehensible to a student market. But for employers, they're closer because they understand competencies, kind of what people can do, but they prefer skills. So there's, a, as you know, a lot of emphasis right now on skills-based hiring and we, I don't know if we will get to a point where we use skills and competencies interchangeably. A lot of people are starting to do that. So you may know that WGU and we're one of the charter members of this work has started an open skills initiative. You've got um, a lot of work by Lumina and around digital credentials, um, credential engine, excuse me. Um, so I think employer, if this is gonna give us a, a, a common language with employers that I think has long been needed. And I would argue that while we get maligned, higher ed gets maligned for, you know, we're not in tune enough with what employers need. I would argue that employers are not that great about articulating what they need. And we have this conversation a lot. So the hot place right now, the hot place right now is in that border borderland between higher ed and employment. Um, and, and, and that's where all the action is. It's where all the sort of new ed tech work is going. It's why the Guild and 2U announcement this week was a big deal. It's all in that borderland, borderland space. I don't know if I answered Kelly's question, but I think we're, I don't think this is a, a particularly formidable challenge. I think employers and institutions who are interested in talking about competencies and or skills will actually find common ground pretty readily. They may disagree on which is the right ones. There are a whole bunch of other things. It's not clear that employers, they talk a good game, are really good at skills-based hiring yet, but mm -hmm. some are trying. You know, we were on the phone yesterday with IBM, and IBM's been kind of a vocal proponent on this, right? Mm -hmm. On on degree skills-based hiring. But it's probably going to happen in the tech sector far faster and more expansively than in places like healthcare. Degrees are going to matter in healthcare for a long time. Even though there's a clear skill. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and by the way, Brian, I will say in healthcare's defense, yeah. you've done your clinicals. If I'm hiring you as a nurse, I want a degree, but I also know you did your clinicals. I also know that, you know, you were on, like, there's strong assessment attached to, to healthcare. Now, I think it's out of date assessment in many occasions because it's still clock hour driven, right? Right. It's not truly competency based, which would be free from time, but, but at least it's there. Uh, I was going to ask something out that you uh, should be featured in the chat if you can see this link. Uh, Paul shared a link to an article he just published in Forbes. And let me know if you can see that. Um, just put a hello in the chat if you can uh, if you can make that out. Um, good, very good. Uh, then I, I will seize the moderator's privilege and ask the, uh, the last question uh, of the day. And uh, Paul, looking ahead a bit, uh, I'm just curious, how are you thinking about the downstream impacts of climate change on Southern New Hampshire University. What kind of planning, what kind of envisioning are you are you doing now? So we, you know, we have a traditional campus and we have an ambitious sustainability program, which was to get us to net neutral by 2030. I've asked the team to move that up to 2025. It's a terribly heavy lift. It's a complicated thing to go to genuine net neutral. We have been long ahead in terms of our purchasing of alternative energy and one have and have won EPA awards for having enormous purchasing of wind power out of upstate New York that offset our carbon uses, which is not the same as net neutral, but it's um, but it sort of makes us sleep a little bit better. I do think that with the violent weather events that we will be that I have already become increasingly common. One of the mega trends we will see will be um, more online everything, right? So um, now that's not great if the power gets knocked out, is it? But 
um, but as we saw in Texas recently. But I think we'll, um, you know, the notion of traveling to a physical place, um, I think a little bit more more doubtful, a little bit more problematic. So we do think that's something um, we want to think about. We are actually doing some learning around delivering in places uh, where power is not reliable. So our refugee camp work, we have now redesigned how content gets delivered, when students upload, download, how it's packaged in ways and speeds up so that that doesn't cost them a fortune. Um, so we do have some some learning that's going on there as well. Um, but it, it, it really needs to, for us, the conversation is how do we sort of work through this at every level? So the big, big plan, the big sustainability plan, but if you drill down through that, it's what are we doing in curriculum? How are we let put, how are we helping our students go out into the world with a different set of questions, values, consciousness about the challenges? What programs are we now offering? We have a program in construction management. It has to rethink its curriculum. So it cuts across everything, Brian, as you know, there's nothing that is not touched by this, by this, you know, existential threat, in my view, hardly an original thing to observe. Well, it really is. And, um, and I don't want to end on such a, 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 a dire note. I, I want to say that I admire that you're thinking this carefully about it. And I think it's especially important that you've upped the uh, deadline from 2030, 2025, uh, which is, uh, that's, a, that's a lot of work to be done in a short period of time. Speaking of a short period of time, President LeBlanc, you've been a fantastic guest. Uh, you, you've just been a, a fountain of information and thoughts. You've been incredibly candid and direct. I, I just want to thank you so much. You have been a terrific, terrific guest. Thank you, Brian. You're very kind to say so. It's just great. There are a lot of old friends on this call, so it's nice to be, be with you and be with a lot of other folks I recognize and meet some new friends. Thank well, you. I'm so glad to hear that. Please, please take care and uh, let me know when your book has a title so we can share it with okay. you. <laughs> That's three readers now. Thank you. My wife, my two daughters. Four. Now, don't go, friends. I just want to let you know where we're headed for the next few weeks. Uh, and let me, again, thank you all for the fantastic amount of questions. Uh, tonight, I'm going to try to do a blog post where I uh, gather up as many of your questions as possible, anonymize the questioners, and post that to my blog along with the recording. Uh, looking ahead after tonight, uh, we have more sessions coming up on a wide range of topics. If you'd like to learn more about them, just head to forum.futureofeducation.us. If you'd like to keep talking about these issues, everything from competency-based education to how to incentivize faculty to how to respond to climate change, we have all these venues on social media from Twitter to LinkedIn, Slack, and Facebook. If you'd like to dive back into the past and meet some of our previous guests, everyone from uh, Kelly Walsh to Robin DeRosa, just head to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive where we have five years worth of wonderful conversations. Now, I have to let you all go because we all have lives to go back to, but I wanted to thank you all again for a fantastic conversation. You all make this work and I'm just delighted to think together with you. Now, until next time, please stay safe and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.